welcome. Um, I'm Mike and uh, Pedersen at the University of Oslo. So I'm stepping in for Dania, which hosted the meeting uh, last uh, time. So she couldn't uh, join today. Uh, so I posted the link to this collaborative document that uh, we used also last time. Let me just share my screen so I can remind you how to um, how to uh, edit that one. So here is the collaborative document and you see up in the either sometimes it's the left, sometimes it's the right, depending on how large your screen is, you can press the buttons here to edit. So there are some icebreaker questions here that you could uh, fill in if you want to, to let us know what uh, programming experience you have. Um, yes. So just a second, let me rearrange my screen. I'll just stop sharing so I can see you again. Yes, so this is the second day of the Fortran uh, workshop. And um, uh, Ole, he will go through uh, today, it will be about object-oriented programming. And Ole, he is a chemist by uh, education. So uh, not a computer expert, but really he is a computer expert anyway, because he's so such a nerd in all this. Uh, and we, we assume that you uh, know what object-oriented programming is today. So it won't be a course in object-oriented programming itself, but how it's uh, solved in, in modern Fortran. Um, yeah, so uh, you should have gotten links to a you know, pointer to where the demos are placed on Saga, so you can follow along uh, there. It's also in the uh, collaborative document. You can also see um, where the, the link to, to where those uh, are. So uh, here uh, in day two in the collaborative document, you can see, it, see the folder for where, where you can find the demos. So as last time, Ole will be kind of going through the demos and, and uh, showing, and you can type along if you want, but uh, <clears throat> um, don't worry if you're, if you don't manage to follow at the speed that Ole is doing it, it these demos are here, and the main point is that you can go back to them and, and give it a try afterwards. And there's also a link to the uh, uh, Google Drive where uh, you can also find the materials and also the PDF that Ole is using today. So maybe we should just uh, get started, Ole. Anything else I should mention? No, I think it's okay. Yeah. Well, I'll just share my screen and we'll, we'll set off. Great. Share. Is it okay? Mike in? Looks good. Looks good. This is not your grandmother's Fortran, which is exactly right. Um, as Mike said, I'm not a theoretical, uh, theoretical informatics expert per se. I, I did some training in, 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 I have some courses in informatics, but mostly I've been spending my time at university on a, uh, in the lab. But of course, you need to do simulations and so on, and uh, and everything is either at that time it was either C C to control the instruments or Fortran to do the computations. And of course, with uh, my age and background from the University of Oslo, of course, we were all introduced and learned the Simula, which is an object-oriented language. So in the early days, we got exposed to object-oriented programming, which is everywhere today. Python is the prime example where everything is an object. So we start right with it. We we can go back to to the old days when there was only one language for for this. It was from mathematics from Fortran from back from 1954. So it's an ancient language. So if you look on the code, how we wrote code this time on the punch card, 
but the interesting thing is is the line line got area is that equal to the square root of something that line you could copy paste and run today so yeah and, and he also so the write and read statements but the, the if statements are a bit awkward they are computed go to's and such so which is which is very bad so the language has evolved quite a lot so it's and then the unit numbers that you see they are still present today and and the people like Kernig and Ricci when they invented C they use different numbers but the same thing apply unit zero one and two and so on ah, it's just la lagging a little bit so the need for standardization came about 10 years later in in 1966 they had an ANSI, ANSI standard called also called Fortran 4, but it's uh, now Fortran 66. Then we had the Fortran 77, which is the standard that most people are fluent with, which is the one that you had columns um, number seven was for continuation, columns zero to six, uh, one to six was, was um, label numbers, etc historically and then in 1991 Fortran 90 came along and when you have free format you could have lines as long as you wanted to you have array operations and, and a few other nice tricks that that came into place a small update in 1995 actually released in 97 pure and elemental procedure if you don't know that you have to go back to the first workshop and because we dealt with it there 2003, it was introduced object-oriented programming, which is topic of today. That came released in 2004, and still not all Fortran compilers have the full version 2003 implemented. There are still somebody who lags behind, and not even though they are up to 2018 standard. Um, you don't really have to to read this introduction too much, but um, yeah, you assume knowledge of Fortran seventy seven, and and the rationale behind setting up this, this workshop is that a lot of people have only learned seventy seven standard, and I discussed with some other colleagues from 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 the universities, and we decided that we should try to convey what's happened since 1997 and, and and what's actually uh how does the modern versions look like so this is what we are going to run through through this this um these were four workshops and we expect that you know how to program and any parallel program is not really covered in, in the offloading part will be will be dealt with and some threading later on with when when we are dealing with NumPy and so on or, or Python and Fortran. But OpenMP and MPI are assumed to be well known and it's not really covered here. So yeah, it's not a basic introduction. This is just scratching the surface, but in showing you the, the new tools that are available. Um yeah, we go straight to it. We'll continue until more or less an hour and we take a break either before the hour or at the hour we'll see how things how things evolve out and see when we will have a break these are the key things that are for any object orientation it's the object the class the abstraction the polymorphism the encapsulation we'll cover all of the yellows some of them just briefly some we go more into depth and um, you should be fluent with object-oriented programming so this shouldn't come as any surprise for you so we'll but we'll 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 explain some of them and then we spend most of the time running through the demos um for this thing i think i've written all of the demos myself so so they are they are in my style so if if you find demos on the internet then they might look different I try to avoid the old things like like labels and such. Polymorphism is an interesting one. Um, 
I think you remember that we on last time we had a function called swap. It swapped the number A and B. And we remember we brought an interface that you could call swap A and B and don't bother thinking what kind of variables they were. We brought a swap function that could take integers and real of different sizes. So you had to use a bad behind the scene. It was a lot of implementation, but for usage, it was only swap AB. Um, this is some example of polymorphism. This is, has nothing to do with object orientation, but but it's a way of, of having the same label on different things and different different objects and such. While you can think of integers and float as objects, if you are fluid with Python, you will already do that. So this is just making it simple. So instead of having to deal with a different function call, the name of the function reflecting the, the type of data it could take, we just write a generic function. It could be square root, it could be anything. And then it, you can feed whatever you like of types. And behind the scene, it will, it will solve that, resolve that and call the correct function. But that's hidden from the users when we call the function. So. This is a very nice thing. It makes life much more easier. Abstraction is the hiding all the data. The, think of it as a bank. You are cannot, well, the bank can't either uh, actually go in and, and, and manipulate the data, like the, 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 the number of money in your accounts. They can only be dealt with with withdrawal and deposits. There are two functions, withdraw and deposit. They will alter the data. The same applies here when we are hiding data from the user and only deal with methods to, 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 to change the data or, or manipulate or operate on the data. So this is also close related to, to, to abstraction and, and now to, to encapsulation. The abstraction and encapsulation are, are a bit, bit um, related. Encapsulation is like this. We can see if you have private instance variable, you have private methods, you have public instance variables and you have public methods and they are all inside the class. Our code is the out, outside code and we deal preferably only with methods. But in principle, we can also access the data. I am all, most of my examples are actually accessing the data also. But there could be private data and private variables and, and methods and everything in, further inside in, in the class so that you can just use a method and that method could, could call on methods, other or functions in, in deeper inside, which are private. So again, this object, Class, class is the whole class. Object is the, is the, is the name of the one that we instantiated or, or called into existence. Then the attributes are actually what we refer to as data. Methods are functions and subroutines, which is, they are different names. In the, well, in C, everything is, is functions in, in Fortran. You also have subroutines that can, can take um, arguments that are to be either updated or, or just as input, which is the intention keyboard. Again, just beating this in, class car, you can see you have, this is the class. The objects are pointers to, to instances that you have two cars. Of course, they have different colors. They have different methods. Well, the methods are the same, but the attributes colors are different. Could be the same, but anyway, there are two different objects of the same class. This is a bit important to have to know the difference what the object is because the object is called into existence. Class doesn't really exist, it's just something, a template for what you can make an object of. So we can run straight into to some demonstrations of this, unless there are some, some questions in the chat.
I don't have the chat. No, no okay. I There's don't no questions. That. And, and um, uh, just a reminder, um, just use the collaborative document at the end there, your questions. Uh, there's a numbered list already started, one and two, if you have questions. And then we can, you know, either answer them along uh, during the, while Ulla's talking, if we can, or Ulla will take them afterwards. Yeah, also, I, I, I don't have the collaborative document up because I feel the yeah, screen with well, yeah. anyway, we'll, uh, we'll tell you if there's something. Just uh, let me know and, and yeah. you, you can use the chat if you want to alert me to something. Yeah, but and then... I, I reminded you how to, how to SSH into Saga there uh, in the, if you don't remember that and how, where to find the codes, samples. Yeah, so, so there. we can assume that everybody is either Everybody that wants to uh, access the code already have. And for those of you who rather sit back and see me doing the thing, we can go through through um, through some demo. So this is the the, the simplest way of doing it. And I try to, in all the, the, the demos, I try to, I have hope, I have done, I, to include how to compile. And of course, in the collaborative document, document or somewhere else, it's stated that which module you should load. So that should also be because of them, if you load an old, if you do, don't overload a modern GCC, which includes D Fortran you might not be able to run all the code because some of them are using rather modern modern things. And last time we got, um, I got some feedback that not everything runs smoothly with the Intel compiler. The Intel compiler are a bit picky because it doesn't really like the capital F90 um, extension. So there is a slightly bit difference if if I ha I have some code that um, that are prefixed, no, they are suffixed with with the capital F ninety, because if if you do that on Fortran, you will automatically invoke uh, the C preprocessor, and the C processor P reprocessor are important if you want to put in in if codes and so on conditional compiling where like debug and such i have one example where it's a heavily used debug and last time i also used that so that's the lesson from for i haven't had the opportunity to to run through all the all the ones using the nv fortran the nvidia fortran which is the old portland or pgi and so you might run into some issues but g fortran uh, from gcc 12 point something works nicely which brings us up to this to the simple object version zero i have a module called calculation or calc i also use call into then iso environment this is set up from this is setting up the, a lot of, of keywords for for sizes and so on i have um, an allocation um, a type called stat which is um, an allocatable one-dimensional vector or one-dimensional field of, of double precision real 64 and it's allocatable this here uh, this is the type and then some functions the, fu the module also contain a function mean, which we all know. Uh, and then I calculate the mean. Um, and other interesting thing is that I learned last time I played all with all the examples that you see, you could say real 64 anyway, any, any kind, and, and initialize it up here. I could say like, like this, and not having a statement down here. This is a normally a good idea, but since these functions are going to be called several times, 
this initiation when you um, initialize the or, or declare the variable are only done once. So the next time, sum will not be zero. When you enter the functions the second time, sum will still contain the last number, the last value. So it's important to start the one with start sum with zero here. And then the rest is, is piece of cake. We we could calculate the mean and then the function is called mean. So it will all automatically be assigned to the function name mean. Then the main program, we, we um, always use implicit non. I also have it up here. As I said, never leave home without it. Implicit non could help you from crashing a spaceship, which we or or in the even worst case, killing people that we went through last time of the bad accidents of type of of don't have full control over all your data types. Even though Fortran is strongly typed, it doesn't prevent overflow and so on. If you declare a a, a byte integer and then what is the number 127 plus one, it has a different meaning in different sizes. You could end up having a negative one and so on. So control over your data types are very important. We um, we declare a derived type called st, which is of type stat. Stat was an array or a single dimension vector and it's allocatable. So we need to allocate the size we want in this in this type, we are just in put the constant five in, and then I used an assignment or vector assignment. The square brackets were introduced in two thousand three, I think, because in in nineteen ninety, the standard before in nineteen ninety, you had to say something like this, because the the Swedish characters were used for for um for the square brackets and so on, and for the capital one for the, the square, uh, the capital for the square bracket. So, but today we can, we can easily do all, all of this because characters have been evolving into 8 bits. So, so we are safe. So then we can use square brackets to declare an, a vector. And then we just assign the vector to X. We print it out. And then we calculate the mean of the vector. And we can compile it and see. We can just, first of all, we can see which GCC we have. We have 12.2.0. And that should also be the case for Fortran. Yep. Well, the same thing. It's, it's, just, a, it's just a wrapper to uh, the front end. And we have 12.2.0 which is fair enough. Simple object zero. Takes a bit time. Saga is not slow, but the IO system on Saga is slow. So if you ever get across, it takes one minute to do LS, blame the IO system. Don't blame the computational thing. Okay. I did not format the output. So you see when I print the st, the, the st sin or or it's uh, the x, uh, s test x, I got five numbers, but in, in many decimals since it's in the precision, and the average is three, which makes sense. Then I don't think. Any questions with this? Not at least on uh, the Not the yet. Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, switch to buffer, simple object one, bang. We um, increase things a little bit. This time we um, 
we encapsulate the procedure and we even give it a new name, make it a little bit more complicated. This time we have the same X, but we also say that this public stat contains a, a procedure called mean that we then set to point to something called calc mean, which is the same here. But then we have to answer what which object does this pretend to, which is this object, which is the one that is inside. So still the fun same function, I need real 64. Uh, in order to use this here, in real 64, this one need to be included for us in the beginning. Otherwise, the real 64 couldn't be reached because, yeah, implicit none, so that we don't screw up with variables. Then we say class stat intention in and out because this is both in and out. But this real 64 sum as before, and an integer 32. I deliberately are playing with integers, so you get a feeling from that you can use several sizes of integers. Integer 32 is, is the, the four byte common integer. I could have said integer eight here, but then some people might run into problems if they start calling it with a larger, larger than 120, 127. As, as we discussed before, all integers in Fortran are signed integers. So you don't get up to 255. If you are using eight, you get 127 because the first bit is, is always used for, for sign bit. So yeah, all integers are, are signed. We do as before, we, but with this time I've cheated a little bit. I, I did. I take the size of the vector that you send in. And you don't send in the vector, you just send in the the, the, the object. And then there's an X in there. And I take the size of that. So it's become more portable. And then I use the X of the J, calculate the mean, and we're done. So. Uh, Ola? Yep. There's a question about uh, the uh, the syntax. The okay. This, uh, so yeah, do you want to check the document or shall I read out the question? Yeah, read out the question. So I may have gotten, but what does, for example, uh, this uh, percent sign X or ST percent sign X do? You have also specified type ST uh, brackets stat. What type is this? Uh, this is is the it's the a, a pointer or or the name of the of 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 the class that you, or the object that you are actually in. Since you see that, and and then with the with the percent and x, this yeah, and the, the percent, percent and x. is mean that this is part of of, of the object. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the object is like the dots. Kind yeah, of, you have the module, and then yeah, it's a, like the dot in 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 there because they dot is used for something else. I actually mm. read the standard on this point, so and then they couldn't use it, so they had to use the percentage sign. Mm. So, but them. Okay, so it's the is the element uh, x part of this? Yeah, the element x part of of this, and and this is is the the type here. The, this. This yes. class here, which is the this class called stat. Mm. And inside there, there are an X and there is a, a function called called mean and calc and pointed to calc mean. Yeah. Inside and, the and, function. And what is the type uh, of uh, the ST? Type stat ST. Types. So you also specify type, and then it's like a parenthesis stat, and then uh, it says st. You see, it's where is that uh, mentioned? Oh, uh, yeah. that is in the main the, program. Yeah, simple Here. object there. Yes, yeah. exactly. So this is the this is the main program. So 
and we this is type here is a derived type or type called stat and we are also say using calc that means that the variable and functions are visible so we we use the module we use module calc and what's inside the module calc is now become available then we declare a variable st of the type stat and stat is the name of the type that we declare here here we declare a type called stat which is like a, a structure in z and stat contain a variable x and it also contain a from procedure or function called it could be subroutine also and i think that's why they they took the the procedure name from from pascal and so on the function mean so the the x and the mean are visible are are elements or or attribute and methods within the stat class and then we call into existence the class here we declare a variable here of the class stat that gives us available st which is the, the name of the object and that has an x inside which we already see in here it's a double precision single dimension allocatable and we allocate st it's it's is is x and with the number five and we do this i think the main program is more or less the same and then we print out the the, the vector and we print out the value when we call the function mean it runs same thing except that we now have encapsulated the uh, the function because this function here now it's called calc mean in here and we can change that whether how we can cal we can make a new function we can change this we can change it we can do whatever we like in here but the user only see mean and x from the outside so this makes it much easier for the user since we are only dealing with the method and, and some data and some attribute here or data as we can call it and we'll illustrate the encapsulation part and so on especially with the functions and you see here we are using the object itself we name the we make an object and but within the the module and so on we we have to use this in order to address the, the the local the local object within the module it could be a bit tricky the first time but the same is is in is in um, is in python so i hope that answered the question okay Yes. Uh, simple object two. Now I even raise the bar a little bit more. I am. Um, I thought it might be nice to to show that we can do a bit more, and yeah. Here you see I have. I have the same public function. First of all, we start with with some statements. We use the environment, implicit non, implicit non should actually. There are ways of enforcing implicit non on the command line. But that's not a very good idea because you might forget that you change compiler and peop other people might um, copy your program and forget that so i in actually insist that you always use implicit none otherwise 
if you ever come across you made a terrible mistake because of that and then you should remember what i said yeah so never leave home without anyway we got the same type this one is said public stat so stat is public we have the data still public the dimension is the same single dimension and it's an allocatable but then we have some private variables in here average and vari variance and standard and skew they are not available from the outside from the user so if if you got if i pre-compiled this class and gave it to you as a library you will not be able to access you will never have any idea that there was actually some hidden variables in here private variables hidden is, is, is similar syntax but you'll see there are two procedures here there are calc and show those are the facing ones that you can access then we have the definition of the thing we um of calculate which this, the calc calculate this so this is the the thing that are in the 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 object that are inside the module this object intention is in and out there are some real variables in here there are some integer variables in here and i do some more calculation i calculate the variance and skew and average and a few other things uh just like in c the free format uh, allows you to use semicolon as as a line feed so that you can have several statements in a single line which makes sense like this typically uh make it less lines so you can have as many as you like i think there used to be a limit on 132 characters per line but i'm not sure if that is the truth anymore but but if limit yourself to well, somewhat otherwise you use an ampersand to extend the line but you can use semicolon to 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 fool it into thinking it's a two line some do loops again it could be done doing this without do loop but um, we as you learned last time but it's a more intuitive and nice to use a do line then we calculate the variance we take the square root to get the, the standard deviation and we take the skew then we take this object which came in like like this here and when we call something here it's all <coughs> sorry it is this object it's just a handle because this um, this class is just it's not an object because it's it's more like it's a class which is a template for for the object so or or or, or the definition of of the object that you make and when you call that one you need a handle inside which is this and this is the subroutine calculate i also made a subroutine show show stat called show it's of type class stat intention in and out this one could actually only be be out but we write out i did some some a bit nicer formatting here and i print it out and we're done with the module then the main program main program we used the fortran environment we used calc as before implicit non the same declare declaration object you see you should see a pattern here in the main program there are almost no changes they are always the same regardless of what nice things we or strange thing we do inside the class seen from outside it only expose this in this in this um, instance the data x and some methods i am um, put some data into x I could have done this in a different way, which we'll show later on. I print it out. They are not declared private. Then I call calc, and then I call show. You don't really need a parenthesis after to, to, to show that it's a function. 
and it's your no this is not well this is not a function this is a call so this one you have to call functions are also called but it, it it's a different syntax procedure or 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 subroutines and function are are a slightly different um in c there is only functions but in in fortran and so there are uh, subroutines and the rules are that in functions the arguments are only in the only output is the output from the function and um, but in subroutines the argument to a subroutine could change so and the major difference between c and fortran now i'm assuming that you all know c very well I, well that might be might not be true but for those of you who know c this is a bit interesting in c everything is by value in fortran everything is by reference so any updates that we do will change the variable in the memory so so that's why they have been very very picky on this intention if you do intention in and you try to update the variable you will not you will get a compile warning compile error or vice versa so we fill the data we print it calculate we show the calculation and i've been nice here deallocate i'm a bit sloppy with the allocation because my program are just meant to run and then terminate and then the operating system will, will do the deallocation for us but if you are nice you should run the allocation if you are running any kind of allocation in a loop it's vital to do it to deallocate otherwise you'll have a memory leak and soon the auto memory troll will be left uh, will be let out of its cage and start making havoc in the system so be careful to do deallocate and learn yourself how to 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 remind yourself to always use deallocate if yeah it doesn't matter if you run it in the loop always try to deallocate so does it work should work you never know yep it prints out six numbers this is the first print line uh, and print i just use the steric here because if you can put in format statements here and so on but uh, yeah you can i also have some examples of that last time i also showed examples but print is a simple statement printing to the standard out we call statistics calculated this is printed from calc there are six elements smallest biggest mean variance standard deviations q etc and it's printed out by show show stat statistic calculated da, 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 da. so now we raise the bar a little bit again questions so far there seemed to be something typed but then it went away so okay not currently we'll raise the bar even more we'll you see this time i made the the allocatable array private so it's none of the variables inside are available for the user the only way to interact now is through the procedures generate gen calc and show to generate one is a little bit tricky because i I use an M to tell how many. M is optional, and it's also interesting because if you don't know, if you don't use M, it will get some some special value. And when you call the function generate, 
you'll call it either without anything and there is no M. So this is an interesting feature that introduced in the later standards that you can have an optional argument. You'll see here the intention in and out for, for the, the pointer to it, for this. And the integer M is of course intentional in, and so it cannot be changed in here. Any, 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 any attempt to update the variable M will be flagged as a compiler error. So it's very, very nice to, to take care of the intent, uh, the intention and it's optional. So it doesn't have to be given. If you give it, it will be used. If not, it will not be used. And I have an N, a variable N. I initialize it to 10. This is the one that are going to be used as a default if M is not given. And then I have as a conditional assignment or not a conditional assignment, but it's a simple if loop. This is some uh, if test. This is comparable to what you could do in C. There is no block here or in Python, it's just a single line. And there's a function called present built into the language. If M is present, then I set n equals m. If not, this if it's not present, it then n will not be set to anything and it will be used its initial value 10. I allocate with using 10, call the random seed, and this random number could be not a not a, a, a series of of, um, of workshop, it could be a study in itself and worthy of many doctorate theses for random numbers because making random numbers are inter inherently hard. Of course, to, to, the, to the verge of being almost impossible, but it's, it's generally very, very hard. Anyway, we generate some random numbers and I multiply them by 10 just to, to get some, some easier number to read. So now we have populated the array with some strange numbers. We call the calculate. This is more or less the same. And we, are, we show, which is more or less the same as before. Now we come to the main program. You see, declared as before. Um, we don't do any assignment of the of, of X because we have generating elements. I call it 15 elements. I call the generation with the generate with 15 elements. So it should generate 15 elements by random. Do the calculation because I call calc. And then we print out the, the result by calling the show. 15 elements and some numbers. The first five elements are like this. But I could say, uh, I could not do this because then I'm on a different place. I'm running here at the, I'm running here in, in the end. Um, directory, but I could say simple object number three. I could change this to nothing. Ten. So it works. We could set it to like 20. And of course, there are no sanity checks here. So here's some, some, some bright guy figure or a bright person figure out, ah, I, 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 I'll fool here. I, I put in minus one. And of course, you know, you all know that will be very bad. They get some, some real crash. But if it's important, you need to do some in some sanity check. Okay. Questions? No new questions. Of course, you can just type questions whenever you want. 
Now we have simple object four. Even if you think it's a stupid question in uh, quotes, nothing is stupid. Just if you're confused, just ask questions. Yeah, yeah. The, the only stupid questions that I, I call stupid is the same question repeated. So if I answer it once, and if you post the same question later on, that's the only type of question <laughs> I, I found stupid. The so other... there is a new new question popped up now. Yeah, read it, please. So maybe I'm a little late, but why the calc module? Why did the calc module generate from the simple object zero f ninety can be used directly in simple object one f ninety? So some module generated from one uh, Fortran script can be used directly in another. Ah, ah, that's an interesting one. Yeah, the the mod. If you if you don't delete the module, you the module file because there is a calc dot mod, and this one can be used directly if you if you <laughs> if you take out if you take out the whole module calc and just use the main program and and then say use calc it will work because it's it's quite common to have all the module files in separate files and then you don't yes. need to deal with with the, the source code anymore you can just say use calc like use iso fortran environment you don't have the source code for that you just import it. You say use. That's comparable to import in Python. Yeah, so, so you just say use. Python, yeah. So, mm -hmm. so if you, I, I, I only did this to make it simple. But of course, there is nothing stopping you from putting the module in a separate file, compiling it, having the module, uh, the cal or the module dot mod, and import it to any kind of Fortran program, just like a library. The only problem that I see is that it's compiler dependent. The Intel compiler doesn't very much like to import modules from the GNU compiler. So the compiler, you need to, to compile the module in, in the pre-compiled form for the current compiler. So if you change to the Intel compiler, you should rebuild the modules. So yeah, the module is just a, a binary file. If you say file, GC compress data. Huh. I I I I don't like to 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 try to stay. we can open it in Emacs and so on, but it it's yeah, it's a it's a binary file. I hope that answered the question. I think so. There's a couple more. Yeah, yeah, come. Uh so uh is integer int 32 intent in optional. Um, equal, yeah. uh, maybe you should read that directly. Also, valid sint is it's a bit uh, complicated. This uh, let me let me put it. Let's see. Yeah, I think maybe you should open the um, the uh, hackmd to see it. At least just see it at your side if you don't. Yeah, I can. Yeah, yeah. it's number three and number yeah, four. Uh, uh... Ah, yeah. I'm not, I, I recall running into some problems with that. Yeah, I, I think that's, I'm not sure if that's a valid one. I, because I run into some, some problems with that. So maybe you have to, to yeah, I, I, I agree that need to be checked because then if the, if you give M on the command uh, as, the, as an argument, it will overwrite the, the M10 
that it's in in the declaration I, i'm not really sure but since i've done it the way i've done i might be that i'm that I run into problems with that, or I copy it from somewhere. Maybe the latter is the correct one that I copied from somewhere. So, and then there's a question number four there. In simple object one, F90 used print. So there's a difference between the syntax. Ah, yeah, I, I said, uh, printing, I print the value of the function st percent mean. So I, uh, anyway, um, and then I, I um, invoke the function. I well, we using the function mean like this. And I remember mean was a function. Um, call the function and print the value since they are printing the value returned by the function. While in the simple object, I call, call a subroutine called calc. So the difference is that um, mean is a function inside the object and call is calling a function inside the object. And both of them actually are calling something, but uh, the first print one is calling a function. The other one is calling a subroutine. Since and since a function doesn't require the call function. Yeah, mean is a function inside the object. Call is a function inside the object. Yep, correct. But those are the, it's the same sentence. Mean is a function inside the object. Call is yeah. a function. Yeah. Yeah, but. How do you access, for example, the SKU from the main program? If it's declared private, you can't. If it's not declared private, you can. So if if it's declared public, you can you can uh, easily access it. If it's declared public uh, and private, you can't. Yeah, so at number four, I'm raising the bar a little bit more. I think the module calc is more or less the same, but I've changed the main program. Here, I've changed the main program a little bit. I am... Um, I do as before, but this time I put up some, some more variables in the main program. This is the first time we actually see real variables or, or variables in the main program. They are integer, they are for housekeeping and admin. But you see, I made a new, a new one. I made type stat, a new function, a new, a, a new variable. And this is, <laughs> this, this is with n. And first I start with the integer parameter n equals three. That means that it's in, immutable. I cannot change the, the n as uh, it's set by three for all time. It's unchangeable, unmutable. Then I make a new one, st, but this time the st is not a simple thing. It's, it's, a, it's a vector. It's a one dimensional array. And the attribute is also target. So it can be pointed at. Then I also make a new one of the same type stat, but it's a pointer, which I call PT pointer. And then I'll, I call ST of one directly, ST of one generate five elements, five numbers. Then I set the pointer to point to two, to the number two, second element of, of, the, of the vector containing objects. Then I call 
PT, which is the pointer, and ask to generate 20 elements. Then I call three directly or just ac uh, or access the third element. Then using a pointer, I am using point array of pointers or and then I go through the three pointers, set pointer to one, two, and three, and then I call PT using calc and PT to show um, a new line to, to have just to have a space between them. So this one is also now we are also introducing a pointer. And I remember last time there was some, why do we need a pointer? That will be more and more obvious the further we go along. You see, now we've got three outputs. The first one with five, five elements. Yes. The second one with 20 elements. 20. The third one, we didn't specify how many elements we wanted, but as we recall, there was a default when there was no M sent in, it will generate 10 elements. And we run through all three, we calculate and show using a pointer. We'll go through the last one and then we have a break. Simple object. This one we we are using making it even more complicated. This one is, is also interesting. Um simple object. You see I have an array here of of the three as before. But I also have a subroutine down here. This subroutine takes in the pointer of, 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 of type stat and an N. So the N here comes in as an intention in. It's fed into generate. So the N will propagate into generate and generate N elements in the vector inside the object. Cal can show as before. So, so far it should be, it could be extremely simple. A slight problem here arise that the compiler has no idea of knowing any kind of knowledge of what kind of arguments the object the OGB subroutine will have. It has no way of knowing this information. So we need to provide an interface, which is the same as header file in C. We tell it the normal stuff, and then we tell it that there are, these are the arguments that come in and out. An interface, this is like that, like headers in C. Then the main routine starts. We set the pointer to str1. We call object pt with 17. And we'll see how it goes. Seventeen. And it all works. And with that, I think we'll have 10 minute break. And then we'll we'll continue what past. Yes. Okay. And there's some more questions, so we can yeah, do that I'll... afterwards. Uh, we can we can take it after the break, maybe. Yeah, or we can take it think? out. Uh, so we'll have break until quarter past. So Ola has answered the questions uh, in in text in the, the document. Yeah, I, I, there are a lot of, of strange syntaxes and so on. So, I mean, as I also wrote trial and error, and it's a good way of learning. 
to get actually to, to learn how, how these things plays out. And by making it private, it shouldn't be accessible. And yeah, so the one with the SKU that I have deliberately made private, if you just made it public, it will be easy. Anyway, we'll, we'll catch up. Linked lists, um, of course, within a class, you can have a pointer to the same class that you are in to itself. That means that if you have one object, it can point to another object of the same class, of the same type. So you can have a linked list like shown here or a doubly linked list. You can have previous and next. There's no end to what you can do there. This is the simple thing. You have the data and you have the next and the point at null at the end or not, not associated with null. You can make trees. You can have one, two, three, and then there is no end to this. Looks like like neutrons from an atom making three more. Uh, a cascading. There, you can have a tree like this. There is no end to how complex structures you want to make. So, in order to illustrate linked list, I think we can go into demo time unless there are something. Some questions about the linked list? Not yet. Not yet. We'll go into the to the linked list. This is a an interesting question that comes up when you when you read read data from a file. You read X, Y pairs to do some statistics or analysis, um, but you don't know how many lines the file have. There are ways of dealing with this on another different day. We will we have covered a little bit of that last time. And, but anyway, a nice way of doing this is to take each line in the file as an object called line. It contains two reels of type x and y then we have another one called type line pointer called next line which it points to itself which looks strange inside class but when you know that each object are independent it makes sense that it can point to the same type and within the and then we have some integers, some housekeeping for I O result, and then we have pairs and some some counters, and then we have real X I and X and Y I, two pointers, and then we have some some arrays, two vectors X X and Y Y, and then we have some pointers. So. What we start with is to allocate the start, which is the pointer. Then we call it the element into existence. Then we say traverse. Traverse is an uh, is a vector that, that moves along all all the objects. And then we nullify the the last one. And then we print out. We allocated the first object, and then we ask the users to give some numbers. Give numbers x y and end with, with the control D, and which is the end of file character, the end of file from, from the keyboard will resolve that it will stop. It will exit the, the do loop. You see that the do loop is here, and then if IO results are greater than one, then there is some 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 error in in the read process, and I print only numbers are accept accepted because there are always some bright people who and give num uh, characters when I ask for numbers. Then we call cycle, and then we start another iteration of the do loop. If I results are negative, we have reached control. We have reached end of file. We exit. If everything was OK, we set the x to x, y, and uh, traverse y to the 
to the um, y i. We allocate the next line. We point it to traverse to the next next line, and then we have one more pair. And then if endo file is detected, we are here. Then we nullify traverse the next line. Set traverse to start. And then we read the data as we have created a chain of objects, print it out. And then we allocate two pairs of arrays because we now know how we now know the size of the array arrays, because we now know how many lines there were. And we run through to deallocate. Because we now have the, uh, we don't need this this um, chain anymore, uh, this um, of chain of objects, because we have filled them into two arrays. Because in, in the more in only sensible way of dealing with with numbers and such in Fortran is is having them as arrays or or yeah having them as arrays, single dimension or whatever. So we can now try to to run this program, read lines. Allocate it first of all, give numbers. We say one, two, three, four, five, and six. And four, uh, five and six. Then we get the file. End the file detected, and it works. So now we read the read the characters from, from the keyboard, put them into a, a line of or a linked list, filled everything in the linked list into, into uh, the arrays here. And then deallocating the whole thing and print out the array. So it's a fairly, Maybe a complicated way of, of, of doing it, but it's uh, it's an illustration of how you can read in any kind of data and, and going through reading them in, then dealing with what you will do. You I mean you could extract things? There's there's no end to what you can actually do here. You can extract the only the data you need into arrays and waste the others and then throw it away by deallocating. So it's um It's a way of learning how to do with linked lists in the simple way. Questions to the linked list? Not yet. Okay, we'll continue because we will actually have some, some ground to cover until, yeah. So encapsulation. We already touched upon this because there was somebody who wanted to access some private variable called skew. Um, they are private instances and variables. And then you are not supposed to, to do that. The only thing that you can interact with is the public instances or variable and methods. Same methods manipulate the data, also called attributes. Man uh, manipulate the it, it's through methods. We already touched upon that. And data can be protected and made inaccessible for the user. So the data inside there couldn't be seen by the user, which makes things a bit more robust. Because if they if the if the users temper with the data and then you call a new method the new method might fail because the users have tempered with the data. So this is why you can protect them, protect it. We can run into two more demos, um, continue with the, with the linked list method to manipulate, export, import data, multiple objects with each own data set. This is a bit more a bit more tricky. Let's 
this is the, the linked list demo one. Let's see if I have this one here. Is this two? Well, linked list demo one. You see, there is no module because I made it, may try to make it as simple as possible. We have a layer called program is called linked list, ISO Fortran and, and non. Then we have a line, same again. We have a pointer, next. Then we have made two more pointers, first and current. You see the next one is inside the line. So that means you can access by line the the everyone the the one, the one that you call into existence by by line. Since it, it's next, so first next and current next is possible to have, and next next is also an interesting interesting concept. And make sure that next next is not pointing to zero if you or none if you try to to access data. So the yeah, it's a it's a common thing in I remember from from if you if you want to check for something next next, and you are in the bad situation where that's not that's illegal. Similar had the concept of 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 and then since. Um, if the first test and the and and uh, with the and and test is false, there is no need to change the second one to 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 do the second test. So if the second test might be illegal. If next as next points to none and you are testing for something there, that test might not be legal. So and then was an interesting concept to deal with them. Anyway, we have some character. Header line because this involves reading input files. There are X and Y. I call them XX and so on. It's obviously later on. And there is an integer, FN equal. That's the, the the unit, input unit. You can put that. You can put anything there, but I just put in FN for two. And an IO stat uh, variable that will use to to check the the the, uh, the input output or the or the file uh, file functions and so on. We nullify. We set them to null. Then we open a file called xy, not txt, and that file looks like this. It contains numbers. And its status is old. That means that it has to exist. Otherwise, we'll get a failure. We tried to then, I could have checked here in open if the file existed, but I didn't. I expect it to be there. I, we have some later on, there are some, some, some tests for this. <laughs> then we'll read the header line of the file. Header line. This is the header for the input file. It's the header line. Then we go into a do loop to read the file. Read fn is fn is reading from unit two, which is that file we just opened. I will start then if if we maybe bail out if there is any kind of error, which it should be call exit anyway. Exit the loop. It should actually call exit there. Mistake. It should be. It should read. It should read like this. Call exit. Because exit is just exiting the, the do loop. 
which doesn't really make sense. So call exit, my mistake. And then we create a new object. Well, we allocate it. We set current X, which is inside the, inside the line and go over to the next one, point to the previous. Then we set the first to current because this is going, going the wrong way. And then we run through all the whole file. We have now have a, a, a chain of pointers. We print the content of the list. We'd start to, if not associated. Um, if that one, we exit the do loop. This time is the exit is correct because it will send us a year, which is stopping the program. So this this exit is, is a correct one. Call exit and exit are very distinctly different call exit is calling actually an exit function that terminates the whole program. Just the keyword exit, exit the doo-doo. We print out, move it to the next, and we're done. So how does it look? Linked list one. happen. Oh, no, it's okay again. Okay. Okay. Yep. Yep. It seems to be, seems to be working. It prints out the, the files and in, in the opposite direction. It, to make it easier, it's it's I deliberately put it in in the opposite direction, or or this one I I also copied part of it. But it showed that you can do any direction. If you want to do go back and forth, you can do a doubly linked list, and you will have next will be previous. So. A linked list to read in a file, not from the keyboard, will also have next one, linked list two, the same, same. Object again, first and current, header line, the data are allocatable. We'll open the file. We'll create a new object and, and, and put the data into there, and then we run it again. Then, We put them into a slightly different way. And yeah, we allocate them one by one. And we have more or less the same. We have now filled the data from the in file. Here's also. Update that one. Yeah, later on I'll introduce a, a test here for for um, for um, if the file doesn't exist because old implies that it has to exist. You can have different way. You can have new. If it then it will be be made be generated if it doesn't exist or unknown. With but then you have to do some checks. 
be increased by a, I put in here j equals zero and the file number and so on. We allocate each one. X equals one and X equals Y. So we um, just extend the array by allocating more. This is also a way of doing it before you remember the other one, we allocated the array by pairs. Now we can do it like this. We can take both X and Y in the same allocate statement. If not associated, then exit, which is brings us here. But if not, we put in the, we fill in the data here and we go to the next line with the loop, uh, doing the loop and we print it out. Those two examples are fairly similar, but they illustrate the same point. Print the list. It did not print the header because we, I didn't read the header. I read it here. I could have printed the header line, but I didn't. We'll, we'll, we'll deal with this in some later, later demo because there are a couple of demos more. So any questions to this one? Don't seem to be. Okay. Okay. Then we can go back here. Yep, there was the, the link list that we just went through. This one, more of this. This is the, the last real demo for, for, um, for, uh, for classes. This one is a bit more complicated. This one will will read the files as before, but it will it will do a, a, a few more clever things and a, expose how you can extend arrays and work with arrays combined with objects and 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 so on. So this one is a bit more complicated. So we have ample time to run through this. Maybe I should delete any modules. So do I have, no. Last demo, number one. I also try to, how to compile and how to run. This require a bit more, a bit more explanation. And then you can also, it's also interesting to read, uh, read um, the references here. Okay, environment. Implicit don't, why is it capital? It has still the data objects, X and Y. They are allocatable. This is the data object. So if we are dealing with X, Y data to be analyzed, we keep them into arrays, single dimension 
allocatable arrays. There is a header, I specified length 80, so it cannot be longer than 80, which is okay. Then we have procedures to handle the data called import, import S, import simple, import L, which is importing by using a, a list, import C, a, a chain list, a little bit different. We have some print to print out the data. We have to have take the sum of the data. We have data write. That is actually writing the data in binary format to the disk. And then we have read. That is actually reading the data from disk. And we have a cleanup that should hopefully clean up most things. So the one that the users can see is X and Y, which are the, are the arrays. When they are not, they're all public. Import, import S, import L, import C, print, sum, write, read, clean up. They are all visible to the users, to the programmer. It contains, now we are routines to, to manipulate the data in the object. The first routine is to read the data and the simple import here is to read the file two times. Sounds like a very bad idea. And of course, it's not the smartest way of, of, of getting hold of the data. So again, intention in and out for this. This is the, the current object. It has file name. You see it comes when you are calling the import function, you have to provide the file name. The file name is of unknown length star. So I, it has to be declared outside the length of the file name. There are some, some variables. I use um, the file name, the, the unit number for the file is 17. Could be anything, but 17 is the most random number. And I start counting from, from minus one. We open the file. It action read. We check. Now we have to check how many lines that exist in the file. And you can already spot something very old fashioned here. I do, a do while equals do while true. I could have said just do, it doesn't matter. I read the file. I read. So, the first one is 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 um, is the line. It's a li the line, and that's character one hundred and thirty-two. So this is the the header line, and we're done. And if we if we get to the hundred, then the label hundred is if the if the end of file is detected, you should jump to label one hundred. This is very very old fashioned and it is not regarded as good, but I, I put it in for reference since reading the file two times is also stupid. Then I now know how many lines there are in the file, but I could take this as a quiz why anyone understood why I wanted to start at minus one. I'll tell you up front. The first line of the file is a header. And since I incremented each time by one, 
after reading the header J equals one. So I could start, start with one. So, or equals zero, sorry. The first one, it will equal zero. And then we allocate. And if it doesn't, if it failed to allocate, it will, it will terminate the program. Here, the call exit is, is okay. Then I call the function rewind on, on the, on the tape or whatever it is, pull the tape back to the beginning. A file could always be regarded as a tape. I say J to one, start running through here. I read this header. The header is, is need to be read. Then I read this. I read the data into this X and Y of X uh, of J. If something is wrong or IO stat is different from zero, we reach the end of the file and we're all happy. And we increment the J. So now we actually read the data by an old fashioned way because we already knew up front because of, of, of this one here where we actually read the file two times. And if the file isn't that big, it's no big deal, but it's, it's not very elegant. It's the simplest way of dealing with it. Then there is a, a smarter way of doing it. It's a simple way of doing it. This one. This is simple because it's very smart. We import simple. Everything is the same. We allocate two to uh, to uh, array of, of of zero. Then we open the file. There is uh, there is an error here. It's not an error, but I once made Emacs to do some some. I think if you press escape Q, these kind of things will happen. Anyway, the the ampersand is continuation line. So we we read the file from file name. Status is set to old, action is read, and IO stat is IO stat. So if, if that failed to open, file is not found, exiting, call exit, terminating. If the file was there, because we are come here, then we can read the file, it is, and it's also open. We read the header, then we run through the file, while not true, while, 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 while true, it's, a, it's an infinite loop. We read XX and YY from the file. And the format is asterisk or star. It's a free format. This is the trick. We append. We already have this, but then we append as an extra element. This is new in, in Fortran 2003. So we can append a new element into the already existing vector by this, this here. This you couldn't do before, but this actually append an element and allocate and reallocate more space to append. I don't know how efficient this is. It might be slow. But it's a very elegant way of appending elements to an already existing array. If anything goes wrong, we just exit. No, if, if nothing wrong, if if we come here and, and it's different from zero, we exit the loop because we reached the end of file. That will put us here. 
after this do loop because this this exit here pertain to this do loop and will be here and we close the file and now we have two vectors x and y which have the si same size that the file have so this is the, the 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 very nice and simple way of doing it but this is was about chain chain of objects so a somewhat smarter routine we only read the file once we generate a linked list we again have this and, and file name and we have class data object this and so on intention file name is in then we remember this you might recall that we have the line and pointer to the next we am um, current we have three pointers first current and hold we have some dummy some variables to be used as housekeeping we have the two arrays x and y they are allocatable yep it can only be two to the m Ah, uh, uh, it should be like this. My mistake. Then we nullify the pointers. It's not that well. It it's a good way of doing that. And again, this this little error here. It doesn't really matter. It's okay anyway, but it should look nice. Remember that these ones won't be updated in, in, in the, the, the examples you have, but they will run. And if the file doesn't exist, we just terminate because then what else should we do? Try to recover in some way. We read this header. We read X and Y from the file. If something is, if, if we are not zero, this statistics this IO stat is different from zero, then the file is, we are already reached the end of file. Increase J, allocate current, assign the XX to, to here, current, then we set X to first, etc. Set current to point to first. And we now have all the data point and we can allocate the arrays this we allocate this of the j because that's the last one so we know the size and we're done we now have a reverse linked list that we can deallocate because we already have allocated because at this point after this statement here if the file was very long we have twice the amount of memory needed to keep only the data. So we'll still store the data in memory twice. Hence, it's a very good idea to deallocate. Then we can do the same again with a slightly smarter way, the different way. For we read the header, I, I don't bother to update this one this now reads the the header we um we read x l and x y this is here inside the the type line and then we nullify current next if we are exit we if we reach the end of file this is a bit complicated, so this one you need to review later on. And then we set it to the next. Now we know the size of the arrays and we can allocate this. And if the result is not okay, then we set current set to head. And then we run through and we now have the linked list in an, in a, an not reversed way, in the, in the forward way. 
it's a lot, it's a good thing. It, it might be a lot of things to write, but it's a good thing to to test and and call exit one if something goes wrong, or or deal with it in another way, or try to recover. So now we import it uh, as a as a chain. So there are, as you see, there are different ways of reading the file. So there are many ways to skin a cat. And printing the data. This is easy. We just print the 10 first and the four last lines to make it simple. I also print to print the header, what that we do in another way. And I calculate the sum. I remember here it's a function. And I also put result as S. Uh, as a result, that means that the data sum will be given this value, but the result are specified like this S is the result is by sum. Here I use the built-in function sum to make it easier. Then we now have the data in, in memory in those two arrays, X and Y, and the header. Then I open, open the file. It's given in file name here. Unit number is two. I open the file unformatted, which means that it's written in, in this, uh, the bits in the memory are written to the file as bits in the memory. It's, it's non-portable, but it's very efficient. And it's a very good thing to do, to do right unformatted for, um, for scratch data. But if you transfer it to another system, another compiler, it might not work. It might work, but it might not. So, so be careful with unformatted, but it's very efficient. And if you are using it for scratch, it's, it's very nice. I said in action, write, print it out or write it out. Then we'll do the same with read. And Unformatted, action read, header, yeah. Clean up with just the allocate and we're done. And the main program look a bit messy because you have to deal with the user to, to get something from, from the from the keyboard. And that's always very tricky because the user can do whatever, they can do many strange things. I have some sanity check. I didn't check very much, but a little bit. Here I inquire if the file exists. I run the test inquire. File name exists. Exist is a logical. File found. And then we can check it. Or if it doesn't exist, we use a default file name. And if that doesn't, uh, yeah. And if the default file name is not found, then it does exit. Uh, exit code two is, is normally used for misuse. And then there is the select statement. This is common to, to the case statement in, in, in C, select statement. And we call the different way of importing. And data is imported. File name class, the data is now imported with one of the routines selected. We need to write out the binary data to file and read it back in and display parts of it. The binary file name is called class.dta. We print to the screen the headers. We can see what we are, which file we are doing. And then we'll have We print the sum, and you see here is the, the size of object. We have the size of it. We have the, the sum, we call objects print, write with the file name, clear the data, 
clear the data and read in the binary from the binary. Otherwise, it will we couldn't be sure if we actually read the file correctly. Then we read, print some, call the object print, and call the cleanup. And we should be done. But it's also time for a break. So after the break, we will run. But before that, I'll tell you a little story about the unformatted file. I was faced with the problem that we had a computer called Comex, and some people had written a huge amount of data on in an unformatted format. Those data, he wanted them to be copied to the deck station that we had that we had in in um, at chemistry. So, how on earth should you take a binary proprietary floating point format on a convex and move it to a MIPS architecture? It was not very simple. But then I met somebody who told me a very neat, neat trick. So this is something that you can try to remember. He said, write a program that opened the file unformatted, read part of it or, or read a number, print a number to the screen in enough decimals so that you are sure everything is, is conveyed. Then write a program called read that read that, that called write that reads from the terminal in free format. Open a file unformatted and write that number binary to that unformatted file. Now you start the read program on the convex, pipe the output to remote shell. Today it will be SSH, that time was already RSH, and issue the and, and the number and the name of the machine and issue the, the command write. So it will read binary, it will print out in ASCII format, transfer it over the network to the remote computer, read it in ASCII format, and then write it back in binary format. And that worked. It took overnight to run, but it worked. So no need to bother with, with any kind of, of converting from this. Everything is done in Fortran. Easy. So we'll have a break. I think now it, it's five past. Soon it will be five past. So maybe we'll take 10 minute break to quarter past. Mm -hmm. Is that Hello, okay, Mike? I think there was a lot of stuff to convey in, 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 in this section here, but yeah, we'll, and, we'll... and maybe there's no questions. It can either be everything is crystal clear or people, I'm not sure what to ask. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, uh, you know, is, go ahead nice and, and, and you ask questions if you have any. Maybe I should pull out the expression mesmerized. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, no, it, 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 but um, I know this last program, it's a lot of things going on inside that one. And this is uh, something that you'll keep for reference and yes. and, um, and and review for later use and come back to me if you find something that I've done stupid. So 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 this is this is an item. We'll take a break. Yes, take a break. See you soon. Quarter past. Yeah, I'm ready. Good. I think I will. It will be nice to start with a quiz question now, but it's very hard for the participant to answer. But but point is that in this program class demo, which you can all see, you you can write the quiz in in the um, can, and but, then but, people uh, can think about it also. Yeah, I I can say I, it and I, then write it afterwards if you can. Yeah, I I can I yeah, yeah you can write it. But if we were to change the variable, the real size from sixty four to thirty two, in the object in the class, how much 
changes would we need to apply on the main program? So I tried to write it under the poll, but I, I missed some part. So if you could fill out. Yeah. If we changed, you see here, the data is in real 64. So it's double precision. If I change that to single precision, how much changes do I need to apply to the main program? Okay. So if people can use the, the HackMD document to, 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 to give guesses. Yes, so uh, mm -hmm. above the questions and below the poll, uh, I wrote the question. I hope I got it right. Well, yeah. I can see it. And what do you mean by how much changes? You mean kind of syntactically yeah. or? Uh, yeah. How much editing would it require? Mm -hmm. Yep. And what needs to be changed? Mm -hmm. There is one answer. Mm -hmm. I think it's fairly obvious that that is the correct answer. So class demo, program class demo, you see there are no variables declared of any special type except the logical or character, but they are admin type things. So if we were to change to real 32 or real 16, are in 32. Nothing will be changed in the main program. So this is one of the beauties of, of, of object-oriented programming that you can actually encapsulate most of more almost everything inside the classes or the objects. Sorry, I'm having some coffee. <clears throat> so it's very nice. You see what we are calling? We are assigning a file name. <clears throat> we um, print out the header. We print out some numbers. <clears throat> and of course, I uh, the, the, the floating point format here, we, we need to make sure that it's a floating point number the f is for floating point so but the, the f format doesn't care whether or not it's double or single so that's okay so it will work the same thing work the same so now we can actually try to to compile this this thing this rather large program No errors. Ah. So how do we? I I I I I, I assume that the C way of doing it here. You, I print out the usage if we didn't give any arguments. So we need to provide arguments. We need either to use <coughs> some of them of the methods. We can take the smart way, and then we can say, take a file name, xy, txt. Of course, it had to be a txt one. If you use the data, it will go haywire. So, so again, 
you cannot make it file safe. There will be pages upon pages of checking and so on if you didn't if you want to make it file safe. As we remember from the Ariane Ariane fiber rocket or, or missile, it, it you cannot check everything. <clears throat> They checked some of the variables, but not the one that actually made the Ariane 5 to, to, to crash. Okay. What happened? Smart append vector. You remember that you could append a vector and, and allocate an extra element by methods introduced in the 2003 standard. <laughs> so I choose that one by saying S for smart here. And then I ask for a file name, X, Y, one dot txt and just to make sure that i'm not cheating x y one looks like this this is the header for and i put in the, the file name in the header so this is the data and we run the program <laughs> and the header its size is 44 some of the x and y's are 13 and so on. The 10 first and the five last lines look like this. And then we clear the data in the binary file. And we read it binary by using the read function or the read subroutine. And then we print out the header. Again, same file. And then the first and the last lines. So it works. So we could say D for default, same thing. It will actually do the same thing because they are just reading the files in a different way. So, yeah. Objects in file are still allocated. That's an interesting one. Anyway, that you can hunt after when you you play with this yourself. Hopefully, I have introduced a few things that might come in helpful for for users for 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 learning this. And I even made an even more complicated version of this. Last demo two. And this has, this is a bit more complicated thing. The, 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 the module and the class are all the same, but I raised, I raised the bar a little bit. First of all, I've introduced this concept. If def debug, so if you want to debug, I put in I put in um, the debug routines and 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 this one here is the is, is it needs the C pro preprocessor. So if your file name end at capital F90 or 08 or whatever, it will trigger the, the preprocessor. If you need to trigger the preprocessor in Intel, you need to, to have a flag that you will need the, the CPP. I think it's FCPP or just CPP. In um, in GNU, if you have the, the lowercase f, you need to, you need to have um, G4 trend minus CPP to, to in, invoke the, the C preprocessor. And for those of you who who didn't participate in the first workshop, you could you please review the example called swap, where I extensively use the C proper preprocessor to do some some macro expand, expansion and so on. Because it it's it's quite nice that it can expand macros for you. It can make life a bit easier. So but it this one is is for debugging. Um what I did was to, to, to see if what we could do more by using um, using pointers. 
and so on. The main program starts here. What I did was to say, maybe we need more than one data set. Maybe we need to handle many data sets and pull them into memory at the same time and be able to extract data between them and so on and to extract data from each one of them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, at least to have full control and have all the data sets in the memory at the same time ready for calculation. You see now the usage have changed to there is no way of reading in. It's the same. It's a default way of reading in. And you need to specify several files and you need at least one. So I need from data sets. Yeah, I check how many arguments given. Um, the data sets are equal to the commands argument given. I run through them. I get the, their file names. I check the file name if it's available. I call, I set traverse to be the first one because I said here traverse is pointed to head. So um, traverse is pointed to the first element, first object in the list. I call traverse, importing the data from file name. If you want to debug, you can print out. I print out the header and some data. I call traverse print. Then we scan the file name and for the dot, and I replace the, the TXT by DTA by using uh, some, some tricks here. Fortran is not very good at this, but there are some things to help you scan and, and file name. And, and then, it, as we all know, file name is, a, is an array, a vector. So you can use the, the vector syntax we covered last time. And slash slash is, is um, concatenating strings. So you can put those two strings together and then it's actually just appending DTA. Read uh, the first write and read it back. And then we can help. Debug, allocate a next object for the next file, etc. until we're done with all of it. And then we run through the object and print out some data. You see, we set traverse back to head. We, um, we use some trim and so on, and we write out a little bit the header and the name and the sum. And then we go to the next object. Then we check if the, the next is associated, which we actually point to a, to a, to a object. If not, we just exit come here, deallocate, and we can put in the debug. So a little bit trickier because it avoids a bit more on pointers, etc. But it's an it's a nice exercise. Don't say anything. Okay. How much files do we have? We have x, y, one, x, y, two, txt, x, y, three, txt, x, y, four, txt. Here, this is the header for the first file. It has 43 elements. Print out the first five first and the last three. We have the XY2. 
you see there are 41 elements. They look a bit similar, but they are larger numbers at the end of it. The number three have 43 elements, slightly different again. And the number four, and then we run through the data objects, which is the one that we had when we, I use trim header name and sum, header name and sum, and they all seem to be okay. They seem similar. 1748.56, 782. It seems fairly, fairly correct. So this seems to be okay. Which is a, a, a lot of, of, of or pointers and head pointers and, and objects and so on, but you just have to revisit to sit down and and um, and um, scan through all the all these uh, antics. Data import this time is is by um, by a linked list, not the, the clever way of, of appending. I I thought they would use a linked list. And of course, here is also a linked list. So there are many ways of linked list. One thing I did not touch upon is the inheritance. So that's become too much complicated for, for a, a simple, simple um, workshop like this. But another thing we can show this time is the uses of, of the debug. If I use uh, capital uh, minus capital D and a name, that one will be propagated into CPP and we'll see what happened. What we can easily, we can do, we can do better. We can say CPP D. No, CPP G for CPP class demo two. Now you'll see that it ends here and do. Deallocate hold and do and nothing more. You see, nothing more. So all these lines with debug, they are not used. But if I say CPP minus D debug, you'll see that those print statements are included. So if debug is set, these print statements or any statement between those two are propagated into the compiler. So if we say G Fortran debug like this, and then we'll have a lot of data coming out. All the loops and so on, it will say true, 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 and yeah. There's a lot of things happening. But at the end, it will say true for head. Um, the own and the hold and traverse are not associated, but head is still associated. So there should actually be a statement more deallocate head. We can easily try that. Ah, uh -uh, yeah. 
There's a reason I didn't put that in. <laughs> of course, that makes sense. Because what happened is that if I dialogate head, it will it will point to nothing and try to do to do to take associated with it will not work so be careful with, with the pointers that it's not assigned to anything if i nullify it it, it will be okay so now it works and that's it's more or less done with them with the introduction to, to object-oriented programming. I have one more demo about, about void types in Fortran, but we'll, we'll answer some questions and, and see what's, if there's anything unexplained and what people want to see more of and so on. So we have, we have some time. I can make a little poll uh, if people don't have questions, at least we can find out if, if things were clear or if it needs to be digested yeah. more. Maybe so, we can we can take the we yeah make the poll, but we can go through go through the, the voids thing before we we go into if things were clear or not. What do you think of that? Sure. Yeah, but you can write it down. I mean this is so the point is that I this is I'm maybe falling into the trap of showing something that I shouldn't. Um, but this is this is syntactically correct, so it's nothing wrong. But it's it's trying to cheat because Fortran is strongly typed. There is no void in C. You can do whatever you like because C is written to is is written for for people who know what they are doing and computer scientists. It's not made for scientists in astrophysics or climate or whatever you like to be in chemistry or whatever. So Fortran is trying to help you, preventing you from doing stupid things like having void pointers and pointers pointing to strange things. Like if you have a pointer, you cannot do pointer arithmetic. A pointer in Fortran cannot be incremented like P++ as in C and point to the next element. That doesn't work. And things like this that you can do in C, and, and there is nothing stopping you from doing stupid things in C and even more so in C++. So C is an excellent tool if you know how to handle it, but handle with care. But it 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 it, it it's so nice, it can do anything. So no wonder why the, the Linux kernel is written in C and many libraries are written in C. Every input, output, and so on, deeper routines are written in C. Fortran is for, for the average scientists who are not computer scientists. So hence it's also strongly typed. So you cannot you cannot cast type from integer to real or whatever. That doesn't work. Sometimes you even get slap on your fingers when you try to assign if you have a long int, an integer of, of 64 type and you try to say a equals or or a equals two it will make problems because it will say we cannot cast a a, a four byte integer into an eight byte integer and etc so it that strongly types you need to use underscore and say in 64 and so on to to cast the the the, the, the number two fixed number two constant into a 64 bit 64 bit um, integer anyway there are cases where you actually want to to convert data into nothing and read them into something that you know very well but it's like if you are writing integers into the memory with the transfer you can read it back using a mold 
like characters or vice versa or whatever you like i mean they, there is no end to what you can do with the transfer you can you it will just write to memory the bits a uh, bit pattern or uh, or any amount of bits and you can read it back with the data type you want using that as a mold for the data and it will be fed into you might end up with non-valid numbers like there are bit patterns for real numbers that are not valid but that's that's your problem if you go down this route so it is possible to change the the data type in fortran but it's mm, something that if you need it you need it <laughs> try to avoid it but i've also made a demo about this is it here we have the void no void it's a very simple one uh, put the window higher up demo five we have an uh, integer of course always implicit non i have i have to repeat this to the end of time still there will, will be people who 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 don't listen uh maybe a rocket fail or a patient die because of non or not using implicit non anyway said it too many times integer int 8 which is a byte or character or whatever 13 elements long and i put in some integer numbers here then i have a string same dimension called string then i call upon transfer transfer is a function so you don't have to write to memory but the the, the c is in memory i take the data field c a vector c or whatever like it, it's a it's a it's a piece of memory piece of data containing bits in this case it's it's integer numbers then i use a uh, and uh, the type a it could be any any letter there but a is first and use that as a template or mold or whatever so that the 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 output from transfer will be characters and then i print those characters and we'll say g fortran void f90 and we'll see what kind of characters comes out of these strange patterns with these numbers hello world hi so these are the ascii ascii numbers for for hello world so it's nothing special we can make it a bit more tricky uh, modules and casting i am um, of course i needed to write a bit more tricky one i am um, There's a data type here called data T, and this is just um, derived variables, no classes involved here. And um, void is character of zero and so on. And data type allocate, well, it's a bit tricky. And this is some piece I picked up from the net. And then you contain set and get data. Just think of it as set and get. Then, I use the data mod, implicit non. I call the set function. Oh, it's a, it's an array of numbers that you can allocate because set this is here data, data k. So I am put in seven, seven, um, a, a vector of seven elements. I put in some numbers here. This is a, a, an integer number. 
a floating point number, floating point number. And this is T for double precision. And then I have some number one, two, three, four, and an A, and a, a, a small number of, of things. So what happened if we run this one? It will print out the same number, of course, since this is an integer. So it came as, as a void. I got it, try to read it as an integer. Of course, I get the same back. Same apply for the number 10. But you see, it's a single precision. Here, it's a single precision number. OK. This one is in double precision. I see all the decimals. Then I have an array, one, two, three, four, five, in void. Read it back. We're using the number one. It's OK. Then I say the A. Read it back. Send it as void. Read it, A. Then I read. I read this number, the number one. I read this number here as a character array. And then I got fine. Because this this number here, if you take the the hexadecimal numbers of the of the character 65 6 a 6 9 4 6 in 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 hexadecimal and change the sequence because it's it's in in the endian type i got this hexadecimal number i translate that into decimal i put in decimal number here and then when i try to to interpret this decimal number as characters I get fine. And I also send in OK, which is here. But I also try to, to use OK as a number. I get this number. And I take the number 7 as this number. Back again, I get OK back again. So in this way, you can transfer numbers like void. So yeah, this was a bit out of 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 the of the class thing and object orientation. But since since pointers are so heavily used, and since you can have void pointer pointers and such in C, I thought it might be beneficial to include it here. So. Then we can go back to the questions. I can yeah, I can put up this one again. This is the one we started off with. We'll we have we have covered class, object, abstraction, encapsulation, polymorphism, not deeply into polymorphism, because there's a lot of things you can do here. And inheritance we didn't cover at all. So the rest is up to you. I sometimes I, I say that I am um, I can teach you how to lay bricks and mortar and, and, and you lay bricks and such, but I cannot teach you how to build a cathedral. That's a bit more. But I can teach you the tools. Or in this time, I in this I'm not even teaching you to learn. Just scratching a bit in the surface of, of 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 the modern thing. You have to to program yourself. So this is not really. It takes quite a long time to learn how to program. I put in the standard. Uh, this is not updated because, but it's also in in day two. You have the 2018 standard if you want to read it. And there are some links that you could 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 uh, play with. And that's about about it. So we can spend some time see if there's some 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 questions coming up.
Yeah, there was one person that answered the two persons which answered the poll, and uh, they say that the material will dense and they need to go through the, it in details and that they're not familiar with pointers. So then it's good that you added this and they can have a look at your example. So they maybe familiarize themselves a bit with that. Yeah, I know it's a very much thing in, 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 uh, in the morning before lunch, having all of <laughs> this, but <laughs> uh, if you are unfamiliar with pointers and, and programming and, and, and object-oriented programming, this is a, a steep learning curve. But it it will take some time if if you really want to dig deep into it. It will take some time to mature. On the other hand, knowing that you can do it, you know see that this is doable. Or if you come across something other people have done, you know that's that's possible. But not all Fortran program need to be object oriented. So this is more to show that what you can do and how object-oriented programming can help you writing better programs and, and hide away some nitty-bitty greedy details that are not really necessary. Let's say you write some object-oriented stuff and, and put it into a library and then people can just say use and that module they're like MPI. There are modules for MPI, which just say use MPI and everything works. So if you want to write libraries and so on, it can be helpful. And if you want to use other people's library that are, are written, then you can probably know why variables are not available while you know there are hidden variables in there, hidden functions in there, and so on. You know, you probably know the reason for that and, and how it's done. So that's why this could be beneficial for people not really into that much depth of, of, of orient or object oriented programming. But it's in, I've shown some examples how you can do it. There are many, many way, other ways of, of doing it. It's it's of every every language is object oriented at this time at this point in time. So we could discuss this for forever. I mean, this is people are discussing in the C++ and, and, and Python and so on because they are in wider use. But it's also an example to show that the language, Fortran language is not dead and is constantly updated with modern features. So next two times, we are not introducing new features in the language we are introducing things that are already in the language and how you can interact with 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 other things so i think we have more or less spot on on time yeah there's a question now coming in question yeah. seven What's yeah, the what's the, 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 this is exactly into object oriented programming. You are preventing the user from tempering with the data. Maybe assume that you want to take the square root. Taking the square root of negative numbers is not popular. In, in the best case, you get a complex number. In the worst case, it aborts the program. So entering data by a method into the object can make sure that only valid values are imported are, are are put into the data structure so in this case only positive numbers are allowed so when the users use set method and give negative numbers the set method could check for that and make sure that no negative numbers ever enter the data structure so when you take the square root you are sure that they cannot be negative numbers. If the users were able to put in anything there, you never know. You have to check each time. So in order to encapsulate the data from the users, you can make sure that no uh, non-valid numbers or you could have d-normals in there. 
that's never popular or or negative numbers or numbers that are impossible so like negative numbers a mass cannot be negative or a quantity like if you have two grams or or a ma or, or one mole of, of, of water you cannot have negative numbers of, of moles or 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 other things so you can make sure that the user are not or that <clears throat> the program cannot put in non-valid numbers into the structure and then that makes lives much more easier for the people who actually operate on the structure yeah and this is like common for object oriented program that, that you have setters and getters exactly to be able to uh, ensure and program yourself protection against various uh, mis user mistakes basically yeah yeah i think that answered the question you are spot on mike and you are better than me on this one no you said, <laughs> you said it all i just summed it up yeah mm -hmm. so yeah and of course you can you can inherit object and there's a lot of of, of nice things to it so yeah mm. especially having pointers pointing pointing in a structure let's assume that you have all these files that i said and you want to extract data from each one of them you can just point the pointer to the structure you want get the data put the pointer to another one and then print the data or, or copy the data and so on so pointers are really valuable mm, like kind of lightweight structures yeah so there's no more questions we'll call it a day yeah we can have lunch and the next uh, fortran part three is the fourth of may so yep. I put a link to the kind of uh, training page there to remind you of that. Yeah. I don't the remember next if one is, Danya, yeah. Next one is offloading, if I recall. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah, uh, I think the last uh, one is, is interaction with, with, with uh, Python interact with Fortran. So offloading GPU using Fortran. Is yeah, so we just pray that everything, well, it doesn't help to pray. We <laughs> can hope or assume or whatever we like that everything is up and running with with saga at that point ah yes exactly because, because it's just after the maintenance uh, yes stuff. saga yes. is going down for main a major upgrade is upgrade from to red hat uh, the whole operating system version mm. uh, yep. i don't know if Daniel usually has some other extra information of course the recording will be made available um not sure exactly where maybe you remember yeah, Dania normally talk about the NRIS and such, but I assume that all the <laughs> participants know that NRIS is, is is an acronym for Norwegian Research Infrastructure, but NRIS is populated by staff from the four universities, four large universities, Oslo, Bergen, Trondheim, Tromsø. And so the, the technical staff and, and the scientific staff are from the universities. And Sigma 2 is, is the admin part of that. Yeah. Okay, so shall we yeah. call it a day then? Yeah, I think so. If there's yeah. nothing more, yeah. Very good. Print, stop sharing. Yeah.